it led me to understand why life makes it so complicated. The complexity is the robustness of life. Let's talk about um, the sort of road leading up to the to the modelling of the cardiovascular yes. cells. You'll have to indulge me in, in this. I assume you're all interested, but if not, <laughs> I, st I want to hear about this. Well, I mean, how did you end up coming on to this idea of modelling? It was so revolutionary at the time. Like, well, it, it, it was, Gunish. Uh, you know, the, the, the modelling that had been done previously was phenomenal. Um, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley um, they received the Nobel Prize uh, in um, Physiology and Medicine in 1963 for the work they did in 1952, which was modeling nerve with a set of differential equations um, describing the movements of the protein transporters. I mean, it's just phenomenal that that length of time ago people were able to do that. They were ingenious. I was just a student um, in 1958, so just six years later, and I'd struggled through that paper. The 1952 paper is, is, is phenomenal. I struggled through it because I didn't really know calculus at that time, and I was so taken by the idea you, you can make biology be like physics. You know, the physicists are computing the movements of the planets. We can compute the movements of the molecules, and could we get the heartbeat out of it? Well, I was doing work with um, a very interesting biologist or physiologist, Otto Hutter, who had escaped from Vienna when Hitler marched in. Well, actually, he escaped before he marched in, which is very good, because he, he got to England and um, became a professor at University College London. I became his graduate student, and he introduced me to measuring potassium currents through the membranes of cardiac cells, which we did, and we identified two particular potassium channels. I then wondered, you know, could it be that those equations that Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley had developed for reproducing the electrical activity of nerve could be modified with the equations I was developing for those potassium channels in the heart, and would that explain why the heart beats like this because we need to know. And so I asked, is there a, a calculator? Well, yes, they showed me a Brunswick calculator. I tell you, it was, it was a machine. You dialed numbers on it. You dialed another number over here and you multiplied the two by going crunch, crunch. And if you <laughs> were clever at this and do it quickly enough and wrote the answers down and then used it to do your integrations, well, in about 10 years time, you might compute about two seconds of activity in the heart. So I, well, this is no good. I need a thesis rather <laughs> earlier than that. Um, so I went to the guardians of what then was an extremely precious machine, the Mercury um, for anti-mercury computer, which was a valve computer. The valves, rather like what you see in some amplifiers, those special amplifiers that hi-fi people like to um, use, um, they were very suspicious of a biologist, of all people, coming to them and asking for time on this extraordinary machine. Um, most of the people who came to them were, of course, x-ray crystallographers, people doing astronomy uh, or particle physics. They were the three that I remember very clearly. Um, and the first reaction was, you, you don't know enough programming and you certainly don't seem to know enough mathematics. They were quite right. So I crept into the back of the lectures given to the engineers in mathematics. I went up a learning curve as fast as I could. I went back to the guardians of the Mercury computer and said, well, I, you know, I've written at least a few lines of code. You know, could you give me time? They did. They said, well, you'll need about two hours. And yes, we can afford two hours. We'll give you from 2 to 4 a.m. Oh. Well, that's when I destroyed my circadian rhythm, but there's another story. <laughs> um, anyway, the fact was that simply putting in those equations for the potassium channels that I'd worked on with Otto Hutter, out came rhythm. And I remember talking with a, 
a physics-oriented biophysicist at University College London, Rolf Niedergerke, and he was also working on the heart. And the conversation went roughly like this. He, of course, was far senior to me. I was just a, a young student. He said, Dennis, I think one of the biggest issues in understanding the heart is what causes rhythm. I thought, well, uh, I, I, I've just shown that. But could I bring myself to talk to that senior person and say, well, I think I've just done it. I just felt so small. And yet what I'd found was what makes this happen. Well, now, yes and no. I mean, it worked. Um, but what we found out much later, I mean, it takes around 50 to 60 years to work out the whole story, is it ain't that simple. Two potassium channels and one sodium channel is by no means uh, not enough because if that was what your heart was doing at the moment, most of you would have been dead before you came to listen to me because it's extremely fragile. <laughs> And what we know, of course, is that nature builds in all kinds of redundancy to give strength to the system so that it doesn't fail if one gene drops out or a mutation happens. Most of the time, uh, that doesn't happen, thank goodness. So there, there's a rough story of how I got into using computers. I, I love that story, but also talking about this redundancy, Let's take a little sidestep into your personal life, if we may. Yeah. You know, being a scientist can be quite demoralizing at times. You already alluded to the fact that sometimes you feel like the smallest cog in yes, a very large indeed. machine. It is. So what, what mechanisms do you feel helped you get through your time in academia that made you feel more robust, gave you those robust pathways, support mechanisms? You sort of alluded to music. Yes. I assume there were people. So, yeah, what, did, what were your mechanisms of support? Well, that I think time? that's a bit like um, the monk in the monastery wondering whether he can go through with this and all his vows and so on, because you know, working in a science lab is like that, isn't it? You just keep going, you know, and most of the time you make no astounding discoveries at all. You, you keep going. Um, no, what broke out for me about 20 years later um, was attraction to music and very particularly because I had by then bought an incredible old ruin of a house in the south of France where I found they don't speak just French, they speak the language of the medieval troubadours, the Occitan poets. And I thought, well, there's, 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 there's my vocation. I will learn all of this. So I joined music groups down there to uh, work out how to sing this language and so on. I now run a music group called the Oxford Troubadours. We perform. Wow. We performed in the Sheldonian Theatre on the uh, 6th of June, I think it was this year, to a crowd of about 500. I mean, you imagine it, a, a language nobody knows. Well, I know it, and there are a few others in England who know it. <laughs> Singing songs that most people don't know about, and we get beautiful audiences. For me, I think that was the break from the monastic life, if I can call it that, of trying to be a, a really good scientist, just keeping going and starting to find another aspect of life. But then it informed my science. Why is my first book on a systems biological theme called The Music of Life? And why is the next book called Dance to the Tune of Life, which was published six years ago by Cambridge University Press? Sorry for the advert, but there we are. Um, you could probably buy it. Exactly, bookshop. the bookshop it's tent is over the there. Bookshop. Yes, it's a very good book. <laughs> Richard Dawkins told me it was a very good book, and wow. we both we I totally can't. disagree on everything except that we've both written good books. Now, <laughs> anyway, what I felt once I'd learnt that that first model built 60 years ago was very fragile. I, it led me to understand why life makes it so complicated. The complexity is the robustness of life. You wouldn't fly an aircraft if you knew that the only system that will control the flight of that aircraft was a single computer program. There is a backup. 
and that's what nature does all the time. Now, why is this related to music? It's simply that when you when you play an instrument or you learn how to sing, you are producing a process. The process itself is the performance. It isn't in the score. Well, it is. Schubert probably had it in his head, but that, that, that's the point, you see. It is actually performance that gives what is important. And I, I interpret biology to be that the way to understand the way in which genes play their role in the organism is that they are actually caused to dance to the tune we play. Now, that's a curious way of putting it. But if you read my book, you might become convinced. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.